walk into this room at your own risk. Because it leads to the future. Not a future that will be, but one that might be. This is not a new world. It is simply an extension of what began in the old one. It has patterned itself after every dictator who has ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of history since the beginning of time. It has refinements, technological advances, and a more sophisticated approach to the destruction of human freedom. But like every one of the super states that preceded it, it has one iron rule. Logic is an enemy and truth is a menace. This is Mr. Romney Wordsworth. In his last 48 hours on Earth, he's a citizen of the state, but will soon have to be eliminated. Because he's built out of flesh, and because he has a mind. As man continues to merge with the machine, it's imperative that when we look at singularity and the rise of the beast system, when we see the eugenics, when we see the DNA testing that is happening, when we see the experiments that are happening all over the world on humanity, aiming at making man obsolete, we must remember one important aspect as we continue on this journey in this short film. There is no new thing under the sun. History continues to repeat itself in the elite of this world. Their plans are not original plans. Their plans are repetitive. And what they're doing, slowly but surely, is rebuilding the tower. Genesis 11, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. Ye shall be as gods. As the Internet of Things begins to take over, the Internet, the AI systems that are approaching, they will make man feel as if he or she is a god. When I started using computers, there were only about a dozen computers in all of New York City. Now we all carry multiple computers in our pockets and our belts. But computation is a lot more pervasive than these gadgets we carry around. Take this rock, for example. It doesn't look like it's doing very much, but it has trillions of trillions of atoms and molecules in here. They're all moving around, bouncing against each other at incredibly high speeds. That's computation. That's not very useful today. It's organized kind of randomly. We can't communicate with it very well. But we're going to change that. We're going to reorganize the vast amount of computation in this rock to make it useful. And it won't just be raw computation. We'll infuse it with exquisitely intelligent software, vastly greater than our intelligence today, and with all the knowledge of the human machine civilization. This rock is going to be a trillion, trillion times more powerful than all biological human brains today. This is going to be quite a valuable rock. We call matter and energy reorganized in this way, computronium. We're going to reach these limits late in this century. And at that time, we're going to turn many of the rocks and other stuff suitable for computation into computronium. And so, to keep the expansion of our intelligence going, we will then need to spread out to the rest of the universe, turning some portion of it into computronium. How fast can we do this? That depends on whether or not we can transcend or otherwise get around the speed of light as a limit. There are suggestions that there may be subtle ways of doing this. One possibility is to send intelligent nanobots through wormholes, which are basically shortcuts to apparently faraway places through other spatial dimensions beyond the three we're familiar with. 
Wormholes through space appear to be consistent with our understanding of physics. If it is indeed feasible to either find or build such wormholes, our intelligence will be so great they will be capable of engineering these shortcuts to reach other parts of the universe in brief periods of time. In that case, we could infuse the universe with our intelligence rather quickly. It would require only another century, that is by the end of the 22nd century, to saturate the universe with Capitronium. On the other hand, if we can't get around the speed of light, it'll take a lot longer. But in either case, expanding our intelligence throughout the universe is our ultimate destiny. In Genesis 3, 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When Satan sells you a story, he will sell you the benefits of the story. If it sounds too good to be true, then you know most likely it's not true. And Satan is deceiving humanity. We are making them trying to feel as gods. The Singularity Agenda by 2045, these are elite individuals with a lot of power and a lot of money who are trying to live eternally, who are trying to set their own immortality via uploading their consciousness into a cloud type of a system where they can then transfer their bodies into an avatar. The goal really is to stay healthy long enough to get to the point where we have these future technologies. We talk about three bridges to radical life extension. Bridge two is biotechnology, reprogramming the information underlying our biology. Bridge three is nanotechnology going beyond biology. Bridge one is what we can do right now. And a major part of that is nutrition because what we take inside of our bodies has a profound effect on our health. It's uh, actually a pretty moderate program. It's not eat low carb or low fat. It's actually eat healthy carbs like fruits and vegetables uh, and avoid unhealthy carbs like sugar and starches. No, the goal of w what I'm doing now, which we call Bridge One, is just to get to Bridge Two, which is only 10, 15, at most 20 years away, which is the full maturation of the biotechnology revolution where we can really reprogram our biology away from disease and away from aging. And that'll be a bridge to bridge three, which is the nanotechnology revolution. For example, nanorobots in your bloodstream that augment your immune system that can destroy virtually all disease. It sounds out of a science fiction movie, yet it is. Why? Because when you see these films and you see these items that you see in Hollywood propaganda, this is speaking to you what their true intentions really are. To live eternally outside of Christ. To live eternally outside of God. To focus on the technologies of the future. Nanotechnology. Biotechnology. Information technology. Cognitive technology. Genetics and robotics. Doing so will allow us to find new sources of energy, create fundamentally new architecture and transportation, allow unprecedented developments of human cognitive abilities, refine artificial intelligences and brain-computer interfaces, simulate complex systems, create humanoid robots and cyborgs, and with the help of nanorobots, we may develop manageable matter. Find ways to transfer one's personality to an artificial carrier. Yet what we need is not just another technological revolution, but a new civilizational paradigm. We need new philosophy and ideology, new ethics, new culture and new psychology, and even new metaphysics. We must reset our limits, go beyond ourselves, beyond the Earth and beyond the solar system. This is an adequate response to the challenges of our time. Thus, new reality and future man will arise. In Genesis 3, 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, let's, let's pause there. 
their technology, their advancements, their beast system is going to look fantastic and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Their system, their singularity is going to look amazing. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. The rebellion continues. A slow indoctrination. Daniel 2.43 And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall mingle themselves with the seed, seed, keyword there, seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Who are the they that want to mingle with the seed of men? I want you to think about how once upon a time, if you wanted to send communication to another part of the United States of America, you would have to write a handwritten letter, put it in an envelope and send it. Now all it takes is a simple email. Once upon a time, if you wanted to talk to a, uh, you wanted to see your family member, you wanted to actually see them visually in Puerto Rico, you would have to travel to Puerto Rico. Now you can do that via Skype. It's been a slow process, but soon, even with virtual reality, you can actually interact with your family member right there in the same room via technology. We have been slowly prepped for something bigger that is going to be taking over. And via the rise of technology, you will see things in the next 10 to 15 years that is going to amaze you. One very important aspect here, if it's convenient to you, it's convenient to them. Think about that. If something is so convenient for you, then understand that there's always a payoff. There's always a trade-off. It's convenient to them. Once upon a time, if you went to the store, you paid with cash. You even had pennies with you. A penny earned is a penny saved, right? Nowadays, you pay everything just about with a credit card that has a chip in it. If you dare pay at the store with a $100 bill, it's almost super embarrassing because they take your dollar bill, they put it against the light to see if it has a little strip inside, then they wipe it with a little marker. They make it look like you're this horrible person when you pay in cash nowadays. Think about the paycheck, the traditional paycheck. Once upon a time, you got paid with an actual physical check. Nowadays, there are companies that will tell you that if you don't have a direct deposit, you can't get paid. It's been a slow transition into the system. And this slow indoctrination is now accelerated. What I've just spoken to you is the simple tiny stuff. Folks, with the rise in automation, with the rise in automation, that is when you will see how all that slow indoctrination is going to be sped up at a speed that you're not prepared for but because you've been put asleep but because you've been sold on the conveniences aspect of it what's coming next what's coming next is going to create huge problems huge problems genetically modified foods the agriculture industry is going to change like you cannot even imagine in automation, it will transform the agricultural industry. The amount of job losses that will happen with agriculture are going to be insane. Because with technology, they'll be able to grow crops better than every, any farmer that you can think of. The meat of the future will likely be lab-grown. Compared to our conventional methods of getting meat on the table, 
lab-grown meat, which debuted in 2013, doesn't involve slaughtering of animals, nor does it require as many environmental resources. Compared to other livestock, raising cows require 28 times more land and 11 times more water. The World Wildlife Fund adds that beef production drives 25% of global land use and forestry emissions. And in the near future, lab-grown meat is going to be cheaper, faster, and more environmentally friendly to produce for our growing population. But how exactly does one grow meat in a lab? The process isn't as weird as you might think. Currently, the most successful method involves harvesting stem cells from cows. Stem cells are the building blocks of essentially everything, from muscles to organs, from which muscle tissue is harvested from the live animal in what is said to be a harmless, painless procedure. The tissue is made up of muscle and fat cells, which the scientists separate from one another. What we need are the muscles, which are then dissected and cultured. Cell culturing is where a cell is removed from a plant or animal and then put into a favorable artificial environment, usually some type of substrate that supplies essential nutrients like amino acids and carbohydrates to grow. All it takes is just one singular muscle stem cell to grow up to one trillion muscle cells. The newly grown muscle cells naturally merge together to form tiny myotubes, which are then placed in a ring. The muscle cells' tendency to contract frequently causes them to grow into a small strand of muscle tissue. The muscle tissue tubes are then layered together to form a hamburger shape. One muscle cell has the potential to turn into one trillion muscle tissue strands, which is a lot of burgers. The lab-grown hamburgers don't quite look like normal hamburgers and are much paler in color and blander in taste. But as scientists point out, that blander taste is a fair trade for an efficient way to create protein and feed the world's growing population. Farmers from around the world face real challenges to producing food because plants are under constant stress from factors like climate change, drought, disease, and pests. These ever-evolving growing conditions, coupled with rapid population growth and changing diets, represent concerns about long-term food security and the preservation of our global environment. Agriculture must respond with timely solutions to these urgent needs. CRISPR-Cas, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, is a breakthrough in biology with broad gene editing applications for plants, animals, and humans. For agriculture, it offers a more efficient and targeted way to develop healthy seeds and help farmers produce more and better food with fewer resources. The healthcare industry, surgeries will be performed by robots. Robots will be able to perform a surgery better than a doctor could, according to them. It's insane what they're planning, folks. It's insane. For most people, AI could sound pretty scary. Many people think about robots from science fiction movies. I think AI is like a very competent friend. It's already helping medical professionals find different clues that will answer our curious questions. In some ways, it will be like a shock. It will impact doctors and nurses and uh, everyone. It's like when the um, internet came along. It can make such a huge difference for mankind. We have developed a clinical decision support system for stroke prevention that can give the physician a warning when you have a patient at risk of having a stroke. Qualalife is a company that has a digitalized device that can find cardiac diseases. We're developing a system for keeping track of how people are doing in nursing homes or in um, home care, for example, in their individual homes. The best thing with AI is that you don't even need to develop a new medication. Just by using existing medication the right way, you can also save lives. You can um, collect all this information and uh, have computers process it in the background. If we use AI for all the data that we now are generating, we can make a huge difference. Even if all the medical professionals in the world will try to keep up with the best knowledge, it's impossible. We need to help each other and we need to um, let the machines and data help us as well. AI is not something that is in the distant future, but it's something that is here right now. It's really about preventive care and thereby make people healthier.
one can't really understand how great the impact will be until you've seen it. We cannot always make the right decision, but um, with AI, it's easier when you have a friend by your shoulder. Robots is the Da Vinci line. Da Vinci is focused on translating a surgeon's control movements into direct action upon a patient. So every time a human moves, the robot moves. Unless, of course, a T-Rex happens to be walking by, in which case the robot actually filters out any of those little hand tremors. So that way you get pure control, no error. Another advantage of robot surgeons is the chance for telesurgery. So let's assume that you're some sort of futuristic penguin research scientist, and you're on assignment off the coast of Antarctica when suddenly you need an appendectomy. But your ship is completely trapped by ice, and your ship's surgeon has been, I don't know, kidnapped by ice pirates or something. What do you do? Well, essentially, you Skype it in. A surgeon on the mainland sits down at a terminal and supervises robotically assisted telesurgery via satellite uplink. Another advantage is minimally invasive procedures. Now see, traditional open surgery can leave big scars, they can take a long time to heal, and there's a lot of pain involved in recovery. But what if instead of making a four inch incision in your stomach, we were able to do the same procedure using instruments put through little half inch holes? Now, human doctors have been doing minimally invasive procedures for years, but honestly, there's only so much human hands can do through these tiny holes in your skin. But robotic precision means those incisions have gotten smaller and smaller over time. And if we continue through this miniaturization rabbit hole, who knows? Maybe one day there'll be barely a notion of what an inpatient procedure is. Now, the future for robotic surgery is wide open. Just take a look at what people have created with the Raven line. This is an open source robotic surgeon and sure, it looks like a couple of mechanical spider arms, but the important thing here is research. You see, it creates a common platform for people to do experiments which will determine the future of robotic surgery. But beyond all that, instead of just talking about robotic assisted surgeries, let's talk about their full potential. We're talking autonomous robot surgeons. Okay, so with machine learning, a robot surgeon could potentially study all the information from successful procedures in the past and apply that to learn how to do those procedures in the future. And if they prove to be as good or better than human surgeons, maybe we wouldn't even go to hospitals to have surgery. Instead, if you expected to have a surgery, you might buy a robot surgeon for the home or for the office or for the spacecraft. Which leads me to a question for all of you out there. Let's say that you have to have a dangerous surgical procedure. Which would you choose? The best human surgeon alive today or the best robot surgeon from 50 years in the future? And with the rise of 5G technology, and if they're going to release 5G technology soon, you best believe that they're work, already working on 6G. They don't release technologies that they don't already have for many years. They think like chess while we think like checkers. With the rise of 5G technology that people are claiming for, because people are prepped and ready for the system, it's going to allow you to download films in seconds. Every new generation of wireless networks delivers faster speeds and more functionality to our smartphones. 1G brought us the very first cell phones, 2G let us text for the first time, 3G brought us online, and 4G delivered the speeds that we enjoy today. But as more users come online, 4G networks have just about reached the limit of what they're capable of at a time when users want even more data for their smartphones and devices. Now we're headed toward 5G, the next generation of wireless. It will be able to handle a thousand times more traffic than today's networks, and it'll be up to 10 times faster than 4G LTE. Just imagine downloading an HD movie in under a second, and then let your imagination run wild. What would this experience be like? The, this experience would be in your real world. So you wouldn't so I'd be, be in, walking down the street. Yeah, you could be walking down the street, and you could pick this up and say, oh, I want a coffee. You could order your coffee directly from it. Alan Smithson is a developer in VR and augmented reality, and says while the potential for this technology is endless, he warns tech innovation is fast approaching a wall. We've seen an enormous growth in the last few years, and we've gone from you know, headsets that make people sick, we've solved those problems by increasing the frame rates, increasing the resolution, but as you increase the resolution of these screens, of course you have to push more data. That's it, like clicking a mouse. 
And right now, the networks can't push all of that data. If glasses aren't wired, they can only handle small go. amounts of data and perform specific tasks. Venus, and it's like right there in front of me. Penny walks in on location. She has to set up the space for a product unveil for a group of clients. The device maps the room in order to construct a digital map of the space. What you see here is next generation hand tracking. Wireless 5G could make its reach virtually limitless. So I think in 10, 10 years out, so we're in 2028 and everybody wears a pair of glasses now instead of a smartphone and those glasses now recognize you. So it recognizes you, your name pops up, so I know, okay, I know who you are, I know maybe your LinkedIn profile pops up. We have um, this camera which is recording the position of this ball on this plate. This Nokia video shows the difference in speed between 4 and 5G. The three white robots are programmed to balance the ball. It only takes the one on 5G three seconds. The 4G network takes 11. A network powerful enough to safely run a hyper-connected world beyond your cell phone, with millions of self-driving cars, delivery drones, smart homes, and even entire cities. But there's a catch. This fast internet travels on tiny wavelengths, much shorter than the ones the current 4G networks work on. That means cell towers or receptors will need to be much closer. We have here something like 10,000 streams for all of the GTA, but the, the target in 5G is a million streams per square kilometer. Per square kilometer. Square kilometers. But I this think. area would have millions, or a million. A million. Yeah. Those dots on the map represent wireless sensors in the roads, on cars and buses, feeding out all kinds of information. Going forward, those sensors will be nearly everywhere. A network that can be deployed uh, densely enough to get enough of uh, the right data uh, to be able to make smart decisions. It's all that information from those sensors that will make a world of autonomous vehicles possible and safe, allowing cars, roads, streetlights, all the ability to communicate at lightning speeds. 5G also has the potential to fundamentally change the way cities work. And to reduce carbon footprint, uh, make better use of energy, uh, make transportation better. Uh, the ability to collect to deploy sensors, collect data, and then do smart things to reduce carbon footprint, for example, uh, all of those are possible. But it's also going to allow them to monitor you 24-7, 24-7 via their technologies. But people have been slowly indoctrinated to the point that they're clamoring for this technology. Be careful what you wish for. They love creating problems so that then they can be the solution. With the rise of automation, an economic collapse is at the door. And this economic collapse that is coming is gonna be very bad for a lot of people because automation is already destroying a lot of jobs. Imagine in five years how it's gonna be. What the elite of this world are contemplating is a universal basic income. There are already tests being performed all around the world. Top-notch leaders all around the world are thinking about universal basic income now today we have a level of wealth inequality that hurts everyone we should have a society that measures progress not just by economic metrics like gdp but by how many of us have a role we find meaningful we should explore ideas like universal basic income to make sure that everyone has a cushion to try new ideas We're all gonna change jobs and roles many times, so we need affordable childcare to get to work and healthcare that's not tied to just one employer. 
and we're all gonna make mistakes. So we need a society that's less focused on locking us up and stigmatizing us when we do. And as our technology keeps on evolving, we need a society that is more focused on providing continuous education through our lives. The idea of giving free money to citizens by way of a basic or guaranteed income isn't new. In 1962, the most famous free market economist of the 20th century, Milton Friedman, wrote, we should replace the ragtag of specific welfare programs with a single comprehensive program of income supplements in cash, what he referred to as a negative income tax. Five years later, Martin Luther King Jr. championed the idea. It seems to me that the civil rights movement must now begin to organize for the guaranteed annual income. President Richard Nixon considered introducing a basic income experiment that would involve more than 8,500 Americans. But one of his more conservative advisors talked him out of it. Basic income as a concept was pretty much finished until Finnish politicians six years ago began fleshing it out. This year, 2,000 randomly selected unemployed Finns began receiving more than $600 a month for two years, unconditionally. Across the Atlantic, amidst rising concern over income inequality, a trifecta of tech titans threw their weight behind basic income. Bill Gates said, over time, countries will be rich enough to do this. Pay close attention to the development of artificial intelligence. Tesla's Elon Musk, warning that emerging technologies will create mass unemployment, said, ultimately, We will have to have some kind of universal basic income. I don't think we're going to have a choice. And Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg said, we should explore. Ideas like universal basic income to make sure that everyone has a cushion to try new ideas. I mean, the reality is uh, people like Mark Zuckerberg, people like myself, uh, have had enormous financial return at relatively young ages. Zuckerberg's Harvard roommate, Facebook co-founder Chris Hughes, is devoting his time these days to promoting basic income. Remember his character from the movie The Social Network? Warren, who should we send it to first? Dwight. Neil. Well now, Hughes leads a network of mostly tech execs who endorse basic income, but with a work requirement. If you certainly work in a job, um, you get paid, that's work. I also think if you're doing childcare or elder care, that's work. If you take a broad definition of work, you don't think there's gonna be a lot of people who are gonna try to game and scam the system so that they don't work? So they can hang out. So, you know, nobody's talking about having a sort of a police force to come to verify it. I think it's quite simple. I don't know if it's that simple. So take somebody who, let's say, is a painter and does a few paintings a month and sells those and sometimes makes a little bit of money off of that. Does that person she qualify? Made money last year. Absolutely. But she only made two hundred dollars on her paintings last year. So that would suggest she's not that serious about it. Sure. And in my view, as a worker, she deserves a basic income. Hughes's net worth is reportedly around a half billion dollars. So then why don't you and Mark create a list and allow the first, oh, you know, million people to sign up and you'll start sending them a check every month. That's not, it's not fair. What we have to do is create a society where everybody who works is guaranteed not to live in poverty. I think that's something that folks on the right and on the left can agree with. You don't gotta be in tech to think that that's a, a, a reasonable idea. This universal basic income is going to be part of the solution that the elite have for controlling the masses. But what comes with this universal basic income? Think about it. Think about what comes usually when you depend on the elite for something. Restrictions, demands, requirements. In this proposed technological utopia, where you depend on the government for everything, I want you to think, think closely as to what comes with it. Mandatory vaccinations, possibly. Mandatory microchipping, possibly. Mandatory segregation. 
They're extremely good at creating a problem to then interject themselves as the solution. But I caution you, Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yet yeah, let God be true, but every man a liar as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judge. Better to trust in God than man. They aren't the solution. They aren't the solution. Pruitt Igo was one of the first project developments where, I mean, the name alone, projects, why do they call it projects? What are they experimenting with these quote unquote projects? If you haven't heard of Pruitt Igo, I suggest you look at the documentary, The Myth of Pruitt Igo. Check out the entire documentary. It goes to show you what can happen when you depend on the government to do everything for you. Pruitt Igro was a 35 million plus development project and it only took three to four years easily for it to be destroyed, completely destroyed. These developments are run by the St. Louis Housing Authority. This is a far cry from the crowded collapsing tenements that many of these people have known. Here in bright new buildings with spacious grounds, they can live. It was a very beautiful place, like a big a hotel resort, I'd say. It was like uh, an oasis in the desert. All this newness. I never thought I would live in that kind of a surrounding. What happened? Well, one day we woke up and it was all gone. We pulled up with the moving van. I knew at that point that it was hell on earth. Pru and Igo looks like a battleground. Vandalism and neglect have left fear among the remaining occupants. In the middle 50s, St. Louis thought it had solved its low-cost housing needs, but instead a monster was created. The experiment had gone terribly awry. It was just uncontrolled. Igo is such a symbol that we tend to forget that it is no different than the city that surrounded it. What happened to St. Louis was tragic, but that's simply not how we've told the story. Pruitt Igo was always fighting against this terrible riptide of destruction in the midst of an economy that was dying. The strong, tightly knit communities and families in which I grew up had begun to shatter, and it wasn't there. And it was one of the most tragic things I've, I've seen. It seemed to me that we were being penalized for being poor. That caused so much anger. Persons that don't have a decent place to stay are willing to take these kinds of chances. Where we live, we're taking chances. This is it. This is out of control and we are no longer going to put up with it. We're not going to tolerate this anymore. I said as tennis, we've got to draw a line and say no more. No more. It was painted as an utopia. It was an opportunity for you to remake your life again. Cheaper rent, newer buildings. But there were restrictions. But there were demands. Demands such as if you are a woman with two or three kids, for example, your husband couldn't live with you. Think about that. There were demands. There were health care type of demands as well. So what happened? You had kids running around without parenting because you had only one mother. They couldn't have a father living there with them. So what you had was total chaos. But these are projects. These are experiments. The name of loan tells you. And when you learn from history, you realize that depending on the powers that be, is not the best way to go. There was a mouse utopia experiment conducted. 
And in this experiment, it, it shows you what happens. There's no such thing as a utopia. The work of Dr. John Calhoun at the National Institute of Health in Washington, D.C. has attempted to answer this question. In a unique experiment that took years to complete, Dr. Calhoun used white mice to study population growth and its effects on individual behavior. In addition to his renowned research papers, he has recorded some of these observations on film. In this 16-cell mouse habitat, utopian conditions of nutrition, comfort, and housing were provided for a potential population of over 3,000 mice. Yet, in spite of ideal conditions, the mouse population met with catastrophe. Individuals were kept track of by color markings on their fur. Factors which normally control population growth, such as predation by owls or cats, were eliminated. Transmissible disease was also reduced. In effect, the mouse universe simulated the present situation of a continually expanding population of humans. To see how Dr. Calhoun's mouse universe grew, we'll use the familiar population graph again. Within the first 100 days, the mice went through the period Dr. Calhoun called strive. This was a period of adjustment Territories were established, and nests were made. The next period lasted about 250 days. The population of the mice doubled every 60 days. This was called the exploit period. The use of resources became unequal. Although each living unit was identical in structure and opportunities, more food and water was consumed in some areas. As the population increased, most mice associated eating and drinking with the presence of others, and crowding developed in certain units. The third period, consisting of 300 days, found the population of mice leveling off. This was called the equilibrium period. Dr. Calhoun noticed that the newer generations of young were inhibited, since most space was already socially defined. At this time, some unusual behavior became noticeable. Violence became prevalent. Excess males strived for acceptance were rejected and withdrew. Huddling together, they would exhibit brief flurries of violence among themselves. The effects of violence became increasingly visible. Certain individuals became targets of repeated attack. These individuals would have badly chewed and scarred tails. Other young mice growing into adulthood exhibited an even different type of behavior. Dr. Calhoun called these individuals the beautiful ones. Their time was devoted solely to grooming, eating, and sleeping. They never involved themselves with others, engaged in sex, nor would they fight. All appeared as a beautiful exhibit of the species, with keen alert eyes and a healthy, well-kept body. These mice, however, could not cope with unusual stimuli. Though they looked inquisitive, they were, in fact, very stupid. Dr. Calhoun called the last period the die phase, leading the population into extinction. Although the mouse utopia could house 3,000, the population began to decline at 2,200. In the shift from the equilibrium to the die phase, each animal became less aware of associates, despite all animals being pushed closer together. Dr. Calhoun concluded that the mice could not effectively deal with the repeated contact of so many individuals. 
the evidence of violence increased to the point where most individuals had had their tails bitten to some degree. Eventually, the entire mouse population perished. Dr. Calhoun's experiment is a classic example of a typical population and its growth when left unchecked. It's all a deception. And when you study history, you realize that experiments have been conducted in a mass scale in preparation for singularity. Psalm 146.3 Put not your trust in princes nor in the son of a man in whom there is no help. And a one world system, a one world government is going to be rising. And you may say, oh, you're being a conspiracy theorist, but hear it from them. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. It is a big idea, a new world order, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think only once, and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. So that the problem of the Bush presidency will be the emergence of a new international order. Within the next four years, we will see the emergence of a new international the beginning, order. The beginning of a new international order. The pieces are in flux. Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder this world around us. I think its task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity and it isn't such a crisis. It's about the future of Europe and a new world order. There's a need for a new world order, but it has different characteristics in different parts of the, of the world. But today, with Asia already outproducing Europe, India and China are clearly becoming part of our new order. We are now facing a common challenge. And the challenge is how to build a world order for the first time in history on a global basis. So, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, a new world is emerging. It is a new world order with significantly different and radically new challenges. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. Good evening, everybody. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. And the president outlined his vision of a new world order in which the U.S. would participate fully. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, a world order that I think all of us would like to see. So I see a world order in the future with a multipolar world order. I think the new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. But in a globalized economy, we are going to have to take global responsibilities and there going to, is going to have to be some semblance of global governance. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions or on so global a scale. Nor has any previous order had to combine the attributes of the historic balance of power system with global democratic opinion and the exploding technology of the contemporary period. And I surely believe India will be a central actor in the new world order. 
They also exist in the The leaders that you trust in, they tell you about it. They're preparing for it. Yet the scriptures tell you to not put your trust in princesses nor in the son of a man in whom there is no help. And with the rise of artificial intelligence, with the rise of the blockchain technology, which could potentially be the brainchild of artificial intelligence. So that was my one slide overview of AI. So now, blockchain, right? So a couple years ago, there was a programmer who no one knows, named Satoshi Nakamoto, who released a paper on a cryptography mailing list detailing a system called Bitcoin that allows two people to transmit value online without needing a third party, namely a bank. So what happens is, instead of a bank being the third party, there are a group of people called miners. And anybody can become a miner. You just need a laptop, right? Anybody can become a miner. And the idea is that when I transmit value to you from me, these miners have to approve this transaction. They have to say, okay, let me check this list of transactions. So every miner has a copy of every transaction that has occurred in the network. And they have to approve whether or not this transaction is valid or not, right? Because they have the list. So you might be thinking, wait a second, couldn't someone just fake, just create a bunch of accounts and say, hey, I'm the, I'm the majority of the miners because the majority of the miners have to approve a transaction for it to be added to this list of transactions. Well, no, because Satoshi said every single miner has to prove that, that they have solved some random mathematical problem. It's called the proof of work algorithm. And that means that you have to have more computing power than the 500 fastest supercomputers in the world combined to have the majority of the computing power in the Bitcoin network. And because no one has that much computing power, no one's been able to hack Bitcoin. And that's why it has a over 100 billion market cap as of yesterday, more than the GDP of some countries, and no one's been able to hack it. It's been around for a decade. It's a really powerful technology. Let's keep going here. But the really, really interesting part about Bitcoin is not the actual application, but the underlying data structure of Bitcoin. So this is kind of a rough diagram of what it looks like, very simplified. But the idea is that we have some list of transactions, right? I'm talking about this list of transactions that all of the miners are holding. And we group these transactions together into little groups that we call blocks. And each block points to the next block. So one block is like, okay, I'm a list of transactions. Here's the next block. And the next block's like, oh, thanks for that. Okay, here's a list on the next block, right? And it becomes this kind of chain of blocks, aka okay, blockchain, right? So it's a blockchain. That's what we call this data structure. And because of the proof of work algorithm, no one can modify it. It's an unalterable, immutable in computer science terms, shout out to all the programmers out there. It's an immutable data structure that no one owns. And this is a very powerful idea. So I like to call this the yin and the yang of AI and blockchain, right? These two technologies go really well together, but no one's really put them together yet. So this is a very futuristic thing. So the yin is AI. AI is probabilistic. It's all about computing the likelihood that something will happen, the prediction of the future using what it's learned. You take blockchain, you take AI, you combine them together, and you create apps that have never before been possible. And that's the most exciting thing these days. This is it. Blockchain, AI, combine them together, use this immutable ledger, and have an AI live on the blockchain, or at least speak to the blockchain, and data is being pointed to, to some distributed hash table or some kind of decentralized storage source. Each person within their system will have a digital fingerprint. You will have a digital ID. In China, they're already having social scores where you may not be able to fly, you may not be able to buy, you may not be able to sell. By 2020, China plans to give all of its 1.4 billion citizens a personal score based on how they behave. So some people with low scores are already being pushed if they want, already being punished rather, if they want to travel. Nearly 11 million Chinese people can no longer fly and 4 million are barred from trains. Next week, the program will start expanding nationwide. Ben Tracy is in China with what's behind the government scoring system. Ben, this sounds like scary stuff. Good morning. Good morning. The government here says it is trying to purify society by rewarding those who are trustworthy and punishing those who are not. So like the credit score that most Americans get for how they handle their finances, Chinese citizens are now getting social credit scores based on everything from whether they pay their taxes on time to how they cross the street. When Liu Hu recently tried to book a flight, 
he was told he was banned from flying because he's on the list of untrustworthy people. Leo was a journalist who was ordered by a court to apologize for a series of tweets he wrote and was then told his apology was insincere. I can't buy property. My child can't go to private school, he says. You feel you're being controlled by the list all the time. And the list is now getting longer, as every Chinese citizen is being assigned a social credit score, a fluctuating rating based on a range of behaviors. It's believed that community service and buying Chinese-made products can raise your score. Fraud, tax evasion, and smoking in non-smoking areas can drop it. If a score gets too low, a person can be banned from buying plane and train tickets, real estate, cars, and even high-speed internet. It's a good thing, this woman says, there should be punishment for people who can't behave. China's growing network of surveillance cameras makes all of this possible. The country already has an estimated 176 million cameras, and it plans to have more than 600 million installed by 2020. It can recognize more than 4,000 vehicles. Xu Li is the CEO of SenseTime, one of China's most successful artificial intelligence companies. It has created smart cameras for the government that can help catch criminals, but also track average citizens. This knows every person, every bike, every car, every bus. You can tell whether it is an adult, a child, a male or female. In several big cities in China, including here in Shanghai, the government is even tracking jaywalkers. Cameras record them going through intersections, zero in on their face, and then publicly shame them on nearby video screens. It sounds very much like the book of Revelation, where it says that you will not be able to buy, will not be able to sell. But never mind, people say that the scriptures are not true, but yet the scriptures predicted moments like these would come. And individuals like Elon Musk and others realize the threat of artificial intelligence, yet it's no different than when a person goes to a voodoo priest to cast out a demon. In, in terms of what, what I think 20 Oh yeah, five, please. Um, so for, for sure, ubiquitous computing, um, AI that's beyond anything uh, like the public appreciates today. I, I think we'll probably start seeing like more like truly cyborg activity, like mm. human brain, like, like, like brain computer interfaces. Okay. Um, like there, there's Alongside the, the AIs that are purely yeah. synthetic? Yeah, I think so. It's the only way we can relate, I think, you know, and have a conversation. Yeah. I mean, there are amazing things happen, like mm -hmm. happening these days, like this. Um, they've been able to figure out how to do an artificial hippocampus mm -hmm. um, in, in rats and monkeys, and, um, and now they're looking at, uh, at doing that to solve severe epilepsy. Uh, about half of severe epilepsy cases originate in the um, sort of hippocampus, and, uh, and by having sort of an artificially augmented hippocampus, they can actually solve um, the severe epilepsy cases. You go to a person possessed with demons to find out how to cast out other demons. Satan will not fight against himself. Elon Musk's answer to this is Neuralink. Yeah, we're going to have artificial intelligence, but guess what? We can hack your brain and turn you into a machine. Man will essentially be that next PC. Elon Musk wants to download your brain. He's the entrepreneur behind Tesla cars and SpaceX, of course, but he's troubled by where artificial intelligence is leading humanity. So he's trying to stay one step ahead with an idea to implant our brains with computer chips. For some people, it's a sci-fi step too far. Not machine, not man, I'm more. Musk announced his project on Twitter, and the reactions came quick. It's hoped that this new technology might help combat eating disorders or depression, and maybe the effects of Parkinson's disease, although obviously such operations on people's brains have their significant risks. Behind it all, though, is Musk's suspicions against AI. In 2015, he donated $10 million to a movement to stop artificial intelligence from turning against humans. He has been calling this brain-computer interface technology Neuralace. In essence, Neuralace is an ultra-thin mesh that is implanted into the skull and forms a body of electrodes which are able to monitor brain function. 
It's not entirely clear at this time how far along the technology is in its development phase. But eventually, Neuralace should enable humans to upload or download information directly from a computer, just like Neo from The Matrix. In a matter of minutes, you too could proclaim, I know Kung Fu. Show me. In order to insert Neuralace, a tiny needle which contains a rolled up mesh is placed inside the skull, whereby the mesh is then injected. The mesh unravels upon injection, encompassing the brain. Gradually, the Neuralace will integrate itself with the human brain, creating the perfect symbiosis between man and machine. So far, Neuralace has been tested on live mice. Upon autopsy, researchers found little negative consequences associated with the insertion of this mesh-like structure. You want to learn Kung Fu? Why go to classes to learn Kung Fu? You can download that information in your brain. You want to learn how to actually be a doctor? Why go to school to learn how to be a doctor? We can download that information right in your brain. Education as we know it, going to college as we know it, will be a thing of the past as technology rises. And you would simply buy and download courses as you need to. As I mentioned, they sell you the benefits, but their answer is wickedness. Because Elon Musk's Neuralink is not the answer, it's still part of the system. And if a universal basic income is implemented, as you saw with Pruitt Igo, and you saw with the Mouse Utopia experiment, and that's nothing, that's just what's public, folks, what's been done in hiding, whoa, it's intense. If the government is the one providing you your salary, they can control who you talk to, they can control your health care, what you put into your system, they can control what you buy, they can control what you sell, they can control what you see. And soon, not even your thought life will be private. Because as the beast system rises, and as mentioned earlier with 5G, Satan is not omnipresent. Only God is omnipresent, but Satan via technology is building his omnipresence. Revelation 13.8 and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose name are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundations of the world the dream the utopia turns into a nightmare That dream, that utopia, has now turned into the nightmare. As the years pass on, as the indoctrination becomes a reality. Deuteronomy 12.30 Take heed to thyself, that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Learn from the history and the scriptures. It's going to be tempting to join their system, but their dream, their utopia, will turn into a nightmare. It will be a technological communist society ruled by an artificial intelligence type of a system that will be led by the Antichrist and the fallen angels. Soon people will realize that there's nothing free being provided by the government. Soon people will realize that via eugenics, via designer babies, via DNA mixing left and right with animals, that their true intentions by this stage in, in the future was to make man obsolete, was to destroy God's creation. And only those who try. Artificial intelligence will rule with a very demonic attitude. Because 
eventually, as you know it, AI will be programmed by people full of sin. Isaiah 5.20 Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. These people will literally call evil good and good evil. And those hailing artificial intelligence, Russia says that whoever has artificial intelligence will rule the world. Those programming artificial intelligence. And in their beast system, they will have a robot army, robotic type of an army. I mean, you have these, why do you need a cop? And you can have a robot that can chase you and not get tired. Why do you need a canine dog? To chase you when you can have robot dogs chase you. With their system, they will have drones that can detect who's in any type of a building. And these robotic armies, controlled by AI, will be able to see, will be able to chase you nonstop. I mean, they're going to be able to recharge their batteries with the sun. I mean, AI and its system is not what it's painted. They're painting it into a dream, but you don't realize that is going to turn into a nightmare. And that is one of the biggest flaws of artificial intelligence. It boils down to sin. Even at this stage, there are people that have done tests with the echo dots, just asking them about Jesus Christ. But because they're programmed in a way that is anti-Christ, Look at the answer. Okay, Alexa, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is a fictional character. Revelation 13, 14 through 18. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that many, as would not worship the image of the beast, should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. Those who decide to not be part of this artificial intelligence type of a system or part of this beast system that is rising, whatever the system may be, will be persecuted. Think of how easy it would be to persecute those who are not part of this system. Why would they want to persecute a person who's not part of this system? Because they won't be able to do what they want to do with you. It's as simple as that. And they could program people by saying, those who are not part of our system are causing a burden to our system. Those who are not part of our system could bring diseases because they're not taking the vaccines that you're taking. Think of how easy it would be to segregate the minority 
who's not willing to take the system into concentration camps. Very easy. Very easy. Also in Massachusetts, the legislature is acting rapidly on a bill updating what the state can do at a public health emergency. That bill has languished on Beacon Hill for some time, but with the flu outbreak, it's now racing through the legislature. NECN's Josh Brugadier is at the State House in Boston tonight. Josh? R.D., the state Senate passed this bill, Bill 2028, today. They did so unanimously, and it gives the governor and the health commissioner the power to act in the public's interest in case in any kind of medical emergency. Timing sped up a hearing and ultimately unanimous Senate approval of the Pandemic and Disaster Preparation and Response Bill in Massachusetts. The bill gives the public health commissioner the discretion to respond to an outbreak like the kind going on in Mexico, to close or evacuate buildings, enter private property, isolate or quarantine people, and to get and distribute meds and vaccines. Josh, any penalty if you don't follow the emergency declaration rules? It can actually get to be a pretty severe penalty because for each day someone didn't follow a rule, for example, if somebody was asked to be quarantined and they decided not to follow that, it could be a fine of up to $1,000 per day they didn't follow and also up to 30 days in prison. Josh Brogadier on Beacon Hill tonight. You've been under investigation, Mr. Wordsworth, for the mandatory period of one year and 11 months. You're found to be obsolete. The purpose of this hearing is to make a finding in the matter and make a sentence accordingly. Do you understand that, Mr. Wordsworth? Your occupation, Mr. Wordsworth? A librarian. A librarian. Having to do with books. Yes, sir. Books. Since there are no more books, Mr. Wordsworth, there are no more libraries. The field investigators in your sector have classified you as obsolete. Your rights are as follows, Mr. Wordsworth. You are to be liquidated within a period of 48 hours. You are obsolete, Mr. Wordsworth. A lie! No man is obsolete. You have no function, Mr. Wordsworth. You're an anachronism, like a ghost from another time. I am nothing more than a reminder to you that you cannot destroy truth by burning pages. You're a bug, Mr. Wordsworth, a crawling insect, an ugly, misformed little creature who has no purpose here, no meaning. I am a human being. Delusions, Mr. Wordsworth. Delusions that you inject into your veins with printer's ink. The narcotics that you call literature, poetry, essays of all kind, all of it, an opiate. You have nothing but spindly limbs in a dream. And the state has no use for your kind. I don't care. I tell you, I don't care. I'm a human being. I exist. And if I speak one thought aloud, that thought lives, even after I'm shoveled into my grave. The Chancellor, the late Chancellor, was only partly correct. He was obsolete. But so is the state, the entity he worshipped. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. We spoke on how that utopia, that technological utopia, will turn into a nightmare. Well, it gets worse for those who worship the beast. Judgment is coming. Matthew 24, 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Decisions have to be made as we're moving towards that singularity that moment of singularity where they want to merge man and the machine together decisions will have to be made by parents when they go to the hospital to have children they will promote to you their agenda on splicing dna we can make your child smarter we can make your child brighter we can make your child live longer let's just tangle with his dna just enough decisions will have to be made in the workforce, decisions will have to be made. There's a lot of brothers and sisters watching this video 
that will lose their jobs because they've taken a stand for Christ. Decisions will have to be made. This is the reason of making this short film. To give you a glimpse of what I think could happen in the future, but to also give you a hope. Just like when you're investing in the stock market or you're investing in any type of, of, of manner. When you invest in Christ, when you invest in salvation in Jesus Christ, man, there's, there's, no, there's nothing better. But the problem is, is that when you see what's coming, it can get you disillusioned a little bit. Persecution is coming. It's coming. But if you endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The future for those within the system, the future for those that are going to be taking part of this system is not a good one in the long run. Revelation 17, 8, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Revelation 18, 3-5 For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornications, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. The judgment that is coming to those that partake of this future system that is going to be arising is going to be very sad to see. It's going to be sad to see because they were warned in the scriptures of what's coming. In watching this video, you too are warned of what's coming. And what's coming is not going to be something that you are going to have an excuse for. Because the Word of God prepared you. The Word of God warned you that the Antichrist is going to be rising. And as he rises, he will sell to you his picture of this utopia, of his new world order. Resist it in Jesus name renounce it in Jesus name and endure to the end because Jesus Christ wins Jesus Christ wins may God bless you thank you for watching this entire video and I hope that this was an eye-opener for many of you that there are decisions that have to be made talk with your family talk with your wife talk with your spouse talk with your children on these decisions that will have to be made at some point in time in the near future and when making these decisions don't make them out of fear for God has not given us a spirit of fear make these decisions in Christ understanding that those who endure to the end shall be saved there's victory in Jesus Thank you for watching. You can download this video and others on our website, tallyforgod.com. Thank you for your prayers, your support, and share this with your friends and families. God bless.